So it's been roughly six months since my last upload, and determining it's been a suitable amount of time for my channel to fester in the wasteland that is the internet, I've decided to continue on my quest in letting the world know what I think on a narrowly guided list of topics. Amidst what has been a tremendous achievement for palindromes, 2020 has seen the climax of a world pandemic. Despite what post-apocalyptic cinema envisioned as the bleak downfall of mankind, the reality is that most of us have been confined to our household to limit community transmission of the virus and sensibly move ahead as a species. A lot of time at home has given me an opportunity for reflection, rejuvenation, reinvention, and the keen sense to recognise that any form of self-improvement is detrimental to the stereotyped image of the modern millennial. Instead, I rugged up in a pair of PJs, put the kettle on, and set my mind on the task of systematically killing it with video games. But boy oh buckaroo do I have one shamey mcshame shame of a pile of shame to get through. For years I've been stowing away gems of the era, like a crazed prospector who retired from a legitimate career in plucking golden nuggets from the crusty undertow of the earth and instead focused on hoarding disks that contain lines of code with no other purpose than to neutralise our motivational spectrum and keep us limp in the grasp of consumer hellscape. Now if you haven't decoded my analogy, what I'm trying to say is that I have a lot of games, and as of March of this year, a lot of time to play them. Persona 5, God of War, The Last of Us, Gravity Rush 2, Forza Horizon 4, Halo Master Chief Collection, Super Mario Maker 2, Diablo 3, Resident Evil 2, 3 and 7, the entirety of the Gears of War franchise, and a plethora of other titles are just some of the games I would omit from this list and deem as the soggy garbage fire underlay that the true classics reign supreme upon. So what exactly is my problem? I don't know, to be honest, I just feel bad committing to a YouTube channel and then abandoning it to play video games. I'd always believed that my lack of investment in the medium was due to my time management, and that if I was to forfeit employment and somehow maintain a steady income, I would have all the time in the world to shirk the responsibilities of my own and escape into another. This pandemic has proven what my fiancé has struggled to teach me, and that is I'm wrong on most accounts. As someone who sits between the niche bracket of a Caucasian male aged 18 to 35, I don't necessarily feel like the video games industry understands me anymore, not my needs or my requirements, but just me as a person. So, as a man firmly rooted in the need to justify my convictions to a group of strangers on the internet who have most likely disliked my video and left profane comments below it, I decided to validate my theory using the one method I knew to work. Procrastinate for several weeks and then hazily type this script with a complete lack of evidence-based research to back my claims. Then I'll do the work. About a year ago I picked up a copy of Persona 5, submitting to the pressure of unanimous praise and my own sense of connection with the setting having recently returned from Japan. I managed to make my way through most of the lengthy opening of the game, weighing my frustration for its handholding and restrictions against just how utterly charming and charismatic the game appeared to be. Despite the oozing creativity and wacky art style, I shelved the game with a promise I would promptly return to it. Ah, oh, then wouldn't you believe it, life marched up, bullied me into a corner and smacked me with a pool noodle until I resumed my adult commitments. Staving off the synthetic menace for a fleeting moment, I recently returned to the world of Persona 5 and commenced my journey into the first palace, which serve as altered dimensional levels our hearts and minds reside in. I'd love to tell you more about the nuances and complexities of this conflicted landscape, but I simply stopped playing shortly thereafter. If you were to survey me on the specifics that resulted in me ejecting the disc from my console, I couldn't rightly tell you. Part of me wants to still play it, but it's a 60-40 split against its favour, and Mama always told me, don't you dare argue with the numbers, they're friends of that guy with the pool noodle. But for the sake of science and imaginary internet points, I'll dip my toes into these tepid waters of uncertainty and attempt to find some clarity in its murky reflection. Persona 5 resonates with my younger self, connecting with a distinctly foreign yet instantly nostalgic part of my childhood. I fondly remember waking up and furiously awaiting the early morning fitness programs to finish so I could catch the next episode of Pokemon, pun intended. What Persona 5 also does is take this platform and link it with themes and scenarios that are exclusively adult. Without giving too much away, Persona 5 addresses confronting and disturbing elements of human behaviour and uses its two coexisting planes of consciousness to both metaphorically and literally represent concepts that are typically sanctioned for more mature mediums. But man, it's just weird having this all come from a game that's equal parts Digimon and Law and & Order SVU. So, cue my cynicism. I just can't accept that high school students living a pseudo-career as phantom thieves is the ideal advocate for exposing rape culture. Don't get me wrong, I admire that the game is addressing hard-hitting issues, and there are definitely other games that have operated in this space. 
But it's just the grinding conflict of high-style anime versus activism and ableism that makes me grateful Jet Set Radio didn't include subtle nods to police state its fictional world seems to find itself in. So, after beating the first boss, I thought to myself, do I really need to play more of this? Pensively, I pondered, not realising that a month had passed before I noticed I'd stopped playing it. For all I know, the game changes pace and moves on to different societal injustices. Or maybe the entire introduction is a total gotcha moment, and the remainder of the game plays out nothing like I experienced. Or maybe I'm wrong on both accounts, and I'm merely being a little prude that's had one too many wallops over the head with a pool noodle to see straight. I'm sure you'll all let me know in the comments, you salivating little waifu lovers. But from where I stand, I just can't sit down and enjoy a video game that is trying to impart such sensitive lessons when all I want to do is creep on some juicy anime titties. So, for me, the cure for cynicism is prevention. Why subject myself to a game that I will constantly disagree with? I get that it's got a dedicated fan base, but that doesn't make it good, it just makes it loved. I also understand that it scored tremendously well from critics. To that, I shrug and cow behind the wall of a nominee that YouTube affords me. But for now, Persona 5 will remain one of those games I will eventually come back around to playing when I forget why I stopped playing it in the first place. Now, I'm going to just lump all these into one big old category of Spaceman Shooty Shoot. I grew up in the Nintendo and PlayStation camps, and never got to experience the Halo franchise as it released, but rather as one suite when I downloaded the collection on Xbox One. So I'm definitely going to insult someone here, and spank me pink with a pool noodle for saying it, but are these games actually that good? I know, I know, it revolutionised modern shooting in video games. But air travel revolutionised modern transportation, and we aren't all acquiring our own personal jets. I know that's a poor analogy, but before I ever played Halo, my go-to first-person shooter was a little title called Perfect Dark. To me, that was sucking heroin through a straw and oh boy was it good. So when I was introduced to the Chunky Boy original Xbox controller and told to jump into a warthog and splatter alien discharge all over the walls, I thought, this just isn't the same. The floaty controls, the limiting weapon selection, the bland environments, it all just lends itself to a lazy production that relied on a fan base to inject it with substance. This is all probably coming across a little harsh, and don't worry, I'm just as miserable as the lukewarm reception I have towards the Halo franchise. But where it really begins to grind my intergalactic gears is when you take this component and mix it in with disgruntled teenagers that claim to have a wealth of experience pillaging the reproductive chamber from which I came. Online multiplayer, with a particular focus on the Halo franchise, is a recipe for disaster in my opinion. I recently began my conquest in the Master Chief Collection, working with a team of eight fellow Spartans fighting an opposing team of differently hued Spartans. Even after hours of playing, I had no idea if what I was doing was working. The guns had either no recoil, or janked up like I had whispered sweet nothings into its cylinder, and hitting enemies felt like probing a sponge with a feather duster. Despite this, single shots seemed to result in my instant death, promptly followed by aggravated messages from my teammates telling me to get good. I don't know exactly how to get good when the aggressive nature of this style of game does not necessarily promote fair play, and often just when I thought I'd gotten the hang of it, I was exploited by a tactic I believe was neither fair nor justified within the scope of the game. Now call me a salty spittoon, but I don't want to be bursting blood vessels and giving my fiancé another reason to believe I'm regressing as a human being in order to be competent in the eyes of strangers. That's what YouTube's for. But Halo for me is an anomaly. To this day, I don't understand its popularity, and although I know it has come under increasing scrutiny since developer changeover, it is still a flagship title. The game does not enable escapism, and revels within a culture that offers me relief when I am returned to the player lobby. Maybe I'm just getting older, but younger generations weren't around to experience Halo as the phenomenon it was during the original Xbox and Xbox 360 days. When it comes to getting good, I would rather do so in the bleak world of Dark Souls, where although it is similarly saturated in frustration, it is more mathematical in its approach to accomplishment. It is tough, but fair. And you will hear that phrase thrown around a lot when referring to Dark Souls, but to be honest, it's completely accurate. Halo, conversely, relies on too many uncontrollable factors to facilitate fun, and I don't see the point in adjudicating a false conviction of satisfaction. Death Stranding is a game that has such a disrespect for your time and values that, 
if given the time to develop, exhibits such toxicity from its relationship with the player that you'll be calling it daddy while it disappears down the street for a fresh packet of cigarettes. For years it was shrouded in mystery, granted a rare and elusive pedestal given the pedigree of games that its creator had produced before it. But living in the shadow of legacy is often cataclysmic when factoring in comparisons, nostalgia, and general hysteria. Then around came Holiday 2019, and Death Stranding was released and the world was finally able to gnaw into the juicy tenderloins of Hideo Kojima's latest masterpiece. Unfortunately, I fall into the camp that believes this prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. Death Stranding managed to craft itself an immunity from typical criticism, with players and professionals alike aligning it with cinema and arthouse production. And to their credit, there is an eerily transcendental quality about this game. It blends and subverts the expectations of what a video game can be, using narrative, visuals, and design to shape a unique world. But if you reflect on that statement, you could classify anything from Tetris to Time Splitters as harbouring the same attributes. To me, the benchmark for a video game is to use narrative, visuals, and design to complement the architecture of an already strong and robust foundation. And it is here where Death Stranding's pillars ring hollow. I'm still unsure if there even is a game inside Death Stranding. Sure, it has the mechanics and the mapping of an open world exploration game, but most of its content felt so devoid of purpose or direction that it must have been a borderline arbitrary decision to even have it there in the first place. In concise terms, Death Stranding follows the main character Sam Bridges, who's on a quest to reunite the splintered remnants of civilization across the United States, who now reside in underground bunkers after an apocalyptic phenomenon known as the Death Stranding. But hey, remember this is a Hideo Kojima game we're talking about, and no game with his name attached will dare go published without a healthy serving of what the hell is going on here at any moment, and why are those girls naked? Now, there is a story, but oh boy, it's a convoluted mess that misconstrues genius for nonsense. To be honest, I gave up trying to make sense of why the fate of humanity had been entrusted into the hands of a surly courier, who is also the president's estranged son, who is also immune to the effects of the game's main antagonist, Rain. Did I also mention that there are babies that are ripped from the cord of their mothers and used as tools to identify the patterns and whereabouts of supernatural enemies? And there is also this ability to travel through time and space by visiting coastal strips that exist within one's consciousness? Oh, and how could I forget, there's also a sub-story within a sub-story that Roundhouse kicks its way back into the main story about some guys whose erogenous zone is a battlefield of war. Now, just like a blender that's filled with roadkill and confetti, there's a lot going on, and although there's a lot of pretty colours, it's more or less a sticky hot mess. Now, if the above story was to be streamlined into something more palatable, I could easily engage with it. But man, this game was born into middle management. Right from the word go, every faction, enemy, and location are dismantled into acronyms that are rarely explained. And you will undoubtedly spend more time googling what it is you're actually doing in what could have been a rich and fascinating world if it took the time to explain itself. To me, this represents an immediate barrier. I can almost hear the game smirking at me when I fail to understand the difference between a Dooms, a BB, a BT, why urine is a formidable weapon, why there are such confusing brand placements, and why Norman Reedus was motion captured to poke his tongue out at me. It's a Swiss army knife of possibilities, but all I needed was a toothpick to wedge that nasty morsel out from between my molars. And we all know that stupid toothpick is the first accessory to disappear beneath the car seat into oblivion. There is just too much going on, but strangely the minute to minute gameplay is pretty dull, made up of fetch quests and delivery schemes that I'm sure the developer team felt clever when tying it to the character's profession. Apart from the stranger elements, the game largely sees you delivering packages across the game world, requiring the use of an assortment of survival tools. At first, it's an endearing novelty, but not much improves apart from the additions to a tedious ABC checkpoint system. So I was either bored, confused, but most importantly, I was confused that I was bored. This is a game that people have been waiting years for. Is this really it? A FedEx vs the world scenario? After a while, I just grew tired of these premature concepts. Oddly, my recommendation is that this game needs more time to discover itself, as it clearly forgot how to be fun along the way. But after so much time, it may be too far gone to be salvageable. I don't know, maybe you could rule this down to me just being too impatient. But how long is long enough to know when you aren't having fun? So this video really just turned into me ragging on video games, 
that I just didn't gel with. But I believe that I figured out the reason behind them. Either the message, the delivery model, or the format was responsible for my reluctance towards deeming them enjoyable experiences. But what does that mean for the video game industry as a whole? I tried to pick titles that were diverse enough in their audience and influence to capture a broadened perspective, and I think I figured out the connection that links them all together. Fun is a concept we learn in childhood. It begins as a primal response to things we like doing, and are often a creative departure from routine or responsibility. As we develop, fun can become associated with the aforementioned attributes, eventually personalising our own tailored approximation of what it means to be or have fun. With the video game industry being one of the biggest businesses in the world, can publishers stake their investment on the promise of fun? Or can they guarantee something else? Something not linked to the player, but rather stakeholders in the product. Whether that be developing larger games that will ensure more players are enticed into buying it, creating cycles that loop players back into repurchasing a license, or borrowing against the rose-tinted glasses of players to deliver a subpar imitation of a forgotten past. I don't think games are really designed with fun in mind. They are designed to be addictive, competitive, controversial, influential, empty, diverse, relaxed or stressful. But fun can be found in these spokes, and as developers make their products more accessible and transparent than ever, there is onus on the player to inject their own degree of fun into the experience. I draw that down to the fact that there are many more people gaming now than ever before. Different demographics, different ages, different genders, people of different beliefs, be it religious, political or geographical. How can any one developer cater to all those needs? It's simple, they don't. They make games that people will want to play because of the flaws in our personality that require us to seek fun rather than addressing the root cause and effect of fun itself. A similar comparison can be drawn between food distributors. It's not enough to simply market to people that are hungry, but instead finding and manipulating people into returning to their particular brand of food for repeat business. And that's where the onus on the consumer comes in. In much the same way we should all know a diet of nutritionally poor fast food isn't justified just because we feel like it, we shouldn't continue to pay to play games we don't enjoy just because we are told it is fun. Seek fun for yourself, and maybe even put that controller down every now and then and reconnect with the real world. Go for a hike, have a picnic, fight a bear, but before all, please make sure to like and subscribe and I'll be sure to update you in another 6 months when I come up with another reason to congest your bandwidth with more ramblings.